features are circular. In fact, like several of them are not. Um, so it has its drawbacks. It also might even combine some eddies that may not really be eddies or something. It might combine two features that shouldn't be, that should be uh, considered. It, it might combine them into one that should be considered as two. But uh, given its drawbacks, another thing to note is that it actually preserves the zonal uh, type bands that might exist here. So that gives us some confidence that the algorithm actually is retaining um, the zonal flow that, and rather than trying to subtract that out. So what we'll do is we'll identify those pixels, those eddy pixels, and remove them um, with some, and replace them with a smooth interpolated field. So I went, I went on for a while trying to figure out what the best way to do this is. You know, one way would be to el eliminate the eddies and replace them with NANDs. But I thought about that a bit, and you can argue that um, in reality, if the eddies weren't there, there would be something there. So that, that doesn't really make sense because you, your sample, your noise gets, gets very large. So I had to replace it with something. And I came up with this smooth interpolated field, um, the details of which I'll leave for you to read. Um, so this is the, an example of a two-dimensional histogram of all the eddy perimeters that we identified in the South Pacific over a certain amount of time. Um, I then divided that eddy perimeters by, from the center by a distance that Dudley Chelton has associated with each eddy. So you get a normalized uh, zonal distance and a normalized meridional distance. And this is just a circle of the maximum likelihood. So what I, what I get from this, what you can take away from this, is that, in fact, on, on average, the, the flow that we're taking out is not zonal. So it's, it's quite isotropic. So that, that gives us confidence that the algorithm is behaving properly. So then I compute the time average zonal geostrophic velocity to the eddies and that um, of the total. And then I separate it. Because it's linear, you can separate it like this. Um, so we wish to quantify the contribution of the eddy term to the total observed. Right? So we want to know how much of this, the eddies create the striation pattern. And this is just um, some sort of metric that we can do that by. Um, this is the variance due to the eddies. So we have the total variance of the field is the sum of the eddy variance plus um, something due to other processes, which may include jets, and then um, twice the covariance between the eddies and other processes. So you need this term because there's actually some correlation between the eddies and the, the other things. Um, so. Without further ado, so you divide by the total to get a fractional variance. I guess that's all that is. So this is the term we're interested in. And then in addition, we do the um, correlation coefficient, uh, where the subscripts just refer to total, eddy only, and difference. So it's just a way of quantifying what we see. So here's a result for 1993 to 1996. Uh, when we do this, we find that this is the total observed. So this would be something similar to what Maximenko would observe. Um, this is the eddy only, so this is the contribution due to the eddies that we've identified. And then this is the difference. So here the contours are those from the total observed field. So while it's difficult to see in this plot, um, the suggestion would be that there is some energy that's not, a, um, quant not attributed to the eddies. Um, the alternative hypothesis would be that our algorithm fails to identify some of that energy that should be an eddy. Um, but there is some feature, there is some structure, and it's correlated with the, the total observed striations. So there's a relationship between the eddies and the striations, as well as whatever's left over in the striations, right? Which you'd expect for the latter. So these are the four averaging periods. Um, so this is the total observed on the left-hand column. The central column is the eddy only, and then the right column is the difference. So you can see that Whatever is left is quite small, uh, but it nonetheless might, may be important. Um, so you can ask me a question towards the end, if you'd like, at, at the end of the talk, of whether this decomposition between eddies and jets is really a valid decomposition. Because the question becomes, are they really orthogonal? Is it, are eddies and jets just like, can you just add them? You can superpose them? Or do they actually interact with each other dynamically? And the, and the yes. 
So that's yeah. that's this. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see it in a second. Okay. But yeah, that's that's that. Um, that's a good question. I guess I didn't put it up there. Yeah. But yeah, it's quite high as well. It's yeah. it's like point yeah. four, point five. So it it suggests that there's some information there. So the result of that of those four year periods is the following. Um, you get a uh, fraction of variance that's about 50%, and then the correlation coefficient between the eddies and the observed is quite high. It's 0.9. Um, so I did this to simulate eddies and jets, and you find that, in fact, I'm missing a lot. So it can be as small as, the eddy can be as small as 30%, or it can be as large as 70%. Uh, so the algorithm doesn't do a perfect job. So that's the point there. Um, but we can test these hypotheses that Schlack and Shelton put forth. Um, so these are kind of a benchmark for us. Eddies of large amplitude and large scale are most responsible for the striations. These eddies are few in number, and the standard deviation decays inversely with the square root of the averaging period. Can somebody tell me what I have on time? Yeah, What's that? You have another 15, 20 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to test these ideas. So the red line, which is this one, <laughs> is uh, basically says that um, the, this is the correlation coefficient between eddies of a certain scale. So the x-axis is the, uh, sorry, amplitude. The x-axis is the amplitude of the eddy in terms of centimeters. And the y-axis is two things. One is the fraction of total variance, which is in blue. And that's the difference. So I'll explain that in a second. And the red is the correlation coefficient. So um, when you minimize the difference, you maximize how much of the eddy energy you're attributing to the total. And similarly, when you maximize the correlation coefficient, you're saying that there's a really strong correlation between eddies of these scale, these amplitudes rather, and the observed. So what you find, instead of it being just large amplitude and large scale, you actually have a broad spectrum, and they're more moderate rather than large. Um, so this is important because it suggests that there are, it's not just a few features that are creating these things, it's actually a large number of, of features that follow these, these uh, that are somehow correlated to the striations that make them. And then uh, this is a two-dimensional histogram of the same, so scale versus amplitude. And the revised term just has to do with the fact that Dudley Chelton's amplitudes are biased low, and so I've done a, I've put some effort into trying to make the amplitudes more correct. Um, so you find is that these these the number of uh, eddies in that intersection that create the striations are quite large. So they, then we looked at the decay with averaging period. Um, so this is 1993 to 1996, and what you find in red is that the observed um, identified eddies as this one, and then the blue is the observed striation pattern. They decay um, as something uh, slightly greater than, than t to the minus one fifth, I mean t to the minus 0.5. So that can be illustrated schematically like this. So the thing on the right is all the different, the four different periods, and the one on the left is just the, the first 1993 to 1996 period. But nonetheless, this, when I first did this plot, and I, it's in the, in the paper, actually, it, we thought it was this because we didn't recognize Schlax and Shelton's typographic error. Um, and then, um, I've, so you really should be compared to this blue dot here. But nonetheless, it suggests that things are more persistent than might otherwise be the case. So if you look at the persistence uh, as a, on a map, you get something like this. And the thing to note is that there's nothing of this color, which is what you would expect from a random eddy model. So if, if all the ocean were littered with these random mesoscale eddies, then you would get something towards the blue. But in point of fact, you don't. That doesn't mean that you know, there's necessarily jets, but it does suggest that there's some persistence to it that may either be eddies follow um, preferred paths by their interaction with bottom topography, in, a, in some sort of like two-layer QG model you might think of, or that um, there may be latent jets in there that actually guide the paths of these eddies. Um, I'm sort of a, 
a believer in the latter, I think, because we looked at, there was a student that worked with my advisor that looked at um, topography interaction. Uh, it's, it's difficult to say, other than a few uh, given examples, that the eddies follow certain topographic paths. So in summary, uh, eddies make up an appreciable percentage of the signal, and that this model of random eddies does not appear to be correct for the reasons that I said. Namely, that there's a broad spectrum of amplitudes and scales that are associated with the striations. These eddies are large in number, and the standard deviation does not decay as proposed. So the statistical significance of this latter statement needs to be addressed more. Um, so what determines statistically significant persistence? Um, so this led us to the following study, which is actually the study that we started with, uh, which is one in sea surface temperature. So the motivation here is that sea surface height was all the preceding stuff, and that suggested that, you know, the eddies were not, they were somehow tied to the striations. But that doesn't mean that jets don't exist. It just means that a large fraction of the energy might be uh, attributed to, to eddies. But, so we wanted to search for eddies, which is our, sorry, our goal. So what could we do? We could look at shorter time scales in hopes that the westward propagation, the averaging, doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a factor anymore. So we're trying to look for snapshots, quote unquote, uh, and we do that in the following way. So this is kind of an abbreviated, I'll go through this fairly quickly. It's an abbreviated uh, summary of our study um, on sea surface temperature. So we take microwave SST from the Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer. Um, it can see through clouds, that's the advantage of that, whereas infrared could not. Um, so you get complete coverage over every two days, so 98% coverage of the globe every two days. Uh, the sensor resolution is itself 50 kilometers, which compares almost similarly to the optimally interpolated data in the sense that we're resolving similar scales of things. But, um, the swath resolution of the data sets are actually higher so that we're able to do things. Um, so this is a swath, swath uh, data set, and then this other one is a gridded. And I'll, I'll show you, I'll emphasize most of the swath work, but I'll show you an example of the gridded. And that's available for these time scales, I mean for this, these times. In addition, we used alt altimeter data, both gridded and along track, and <coughs> vertically profiling Argo floats. Uh, relative to a world ocean atlas. Um, so that gives us some sort of depth structure to these features that we'll look at. We restrict our analysis uh, to these periods so that we don't have a seasonal bias. Um, and just to motivate the study again, the altimeter sees a pattern similar to this. Distance between uh, crossovers can be as large as 30, 100 kilometers, whereas the scanning radiometer, it actually goes in a circle and it goes over the Earth. It, it, does a complete coverage of the Earth in, um, sorry, in two days, right? So this is a time average of the gridded product um, between 2002 and 2011. And it's a computation of something basically analogous to zonal geostrophic velocity. Um, so you get an equator word SST gradient. So if this were showing red, you'd see alternating um, temperatures, temperature gradients that would be associated with eastward and westward flows under a geostrophic uh, approximation. So this kind of says that um, SST has these patterns as well. So what did we do? We applied an edge detection algorithm, which is a front detector algorithm, to swath SST. Um, we averaged these detections for a period of time, about 21 days, and identified these repeated de detections. We refer to these patterns that we get out of these detections as bands. So I'm defining SST front probability as the sum of detections divided by the sum of clear pixels at a given latitude and longitude and over a given period of time. Notes on the averaging period. Um, T greater than one month blurs the distinctions between eddies and jets, but T less than 14 days results in noise in this uh, equation. So we chose T about 20 days, the averaging period to be 21 days. So we, I'm referring to that as a snapshot. So this is an example of a swath over the Indian Ocean with the front detectors overlaid. Um, if you want to know more about the details of this detector, um, come see me afterwards. But basically, you, you look at little windows within the swath. You um, look at the histogram of, that, of the pixels in that swath. So you have temperature versus the number. 
And if there's a bimodal popula population, you can say that there's a front or not a front. And this uh, statistic theta becomes a uh, discriminant between those two. In addition, there's these other um, steps that you have to do about cohesion and contour following. Um, but it tends to, in a, in, in a way better than uh, just a gradient detector, it tends to identify weak fronts as well. So SST front probability, this is that if you just applied that 92 algorithm, and this is some work that I did on trying to make it less sensitive to the background temperature gradient. Um, so it reduces the amount of noise. So these features is, are what we refer to as bands. Um, if I did that, sorry for the, the number of things on that. If I identified all these features, um, actually, if I made that plot black and white and did that over the entire globe, it would look like the first plot. Um, if I then took, zoomed in on some subtropical areas, I did this actually for, every, for all five ocean basins, but here I show two. And then I identified several of the bands that looked very prominent. Um, so that takes us to the right-hand side of the plot on the top. Um, I can then construct a coordinate system where I, I center my coordinate system on very large gradients within that band. So I look at the SST gradient across the band, and I threshold that. And that defines these, these patterns. So I can, I can start to make little postage stamps, if you will, um, that are tangent to the band. And then I have all these things for like nine years, right? So I can create, it, if you do the same thing for one year, you get this, you get, you get this result. But here I've done it for nine years. If, if I then, I can then take data that goes inside this, um, this box, this little postage stamp, and create composites. This is similar to what's been done by other people when they talk about eddies. So a composite eddy. And so this is a composite front. Um, and out of this composite front, where these features are high, I get this pattern where it's a two-lobe pattern. I'm not saying it's a dipole. It's just a composite. In the, in the composite, it's a dipole. But you get a, a warm temperature anomaly or a raised sea surface height over here and a cool temperature anomaly or a depressed sea surface height over here. So that has flow with it that's associated with it based off geostrophy. So this is in the southern ocean, this term, this one here. So you have flow that's like this. And so this is an eastward flowing jet, eastward flowing current. So the question becomes, is there a jet in there or not? But it turns out that these patterns that we observed are mostly um, generated by these neighboring eddies. Um, so I'll skip that. If you do the same thing with sea surface temperature anomaly, may, that, by doing that, I, I took a high-pass filter of the data. It's the similar, it's the identical thing as uh, Maximenko and company. And then this SSH anomaly, you get, so these are the gridded products. You get similar patterns. Um, so the, the implication here is that these bands are actually created by neighboring eddies of opposite polarity. And then I did it with Argo data just to see what kind of depth structure would be like. Um, so this is the number of Argo floats that come through that little postage stamp. And this is at 20 meters, 200 meters, and 1,000 meters. And you can see there's actually a, a shift. It starts to shift zonally of where the dipole is located. So this is temperature anomaly relative to a climatology, and you can see a pattern. In it. If you looked at a cross-section of that at the location of maximum um, uh, gradient, you get this two-section. So the, the y-axis here is the long band distance, and the, the x-axis, rather, and the y-axis is depth. So you get two, a dipole-like structure. Um, so you get a cold anomaly and a warm anomaly. The interesting thing about this, uh, however, is that the, the structure actually kind of migrates north. And I was talking with um, Pavel Berloff about this at one point, and he said that this might carry significance because a lot of his work with jets predicts some sort of meridional shift of the jet structure relative to the surface. Um, so this is the, the zonal flow associated with it. So coming out of the board would be something on the order of 10 meters, centimeters per second. So this is in a three-week average. So it's almost like an instantaneous snapshot. And then it's notable that the depth penetrates greater than 600 meters. So Van Sibyl is another scientist who did something similar, but he didn't do it in this band coordinate. He found uh, with Argo data that you can get a depth structure that, structure that extends to about 1,000 meters. 
Um, the neat thing about this is that there's actually a uh, meridional, observed meridional shift about it, um, the band which Van Sibyl has not seen. So you can do something similar with the persistence for SST. If you do that, it's qualitatively, um, quantitatively different, but qualitatively similar. So the pattern ends up being similar. Um, these are all the subtropical areas that I identified. And this is sort of the scatter plot. So you get a relationship between SST persistence and SSH persistence. And the reason that that might be important is the following. The uh, microwave SST data is only limited to nine years. The SSH data is only limited to 22 years. Um, so as SSH continues, then you know, this doesn't matter so much. But right now, the, the statistical significance of this persistence likely depends upon the record length. Um, so infrared SST, which would then be related to microwave SST, is actually quite long. So we could potentially say something significant, significant by using infrared SST. So in summary, uh, multiple quasi-zonal bands are observed in microwave SST. Bands in short duration averages result from primarily from neighboring eddies, but there may be some signal in between that we can't see. Um, and there's mild to strong persistence in most of the world. Um, I'm not sure why that's great. So the question becomes, do multiple zonal jets exist in the oceans? So after all that work, I'm not sure. If so, they are weak or they're latent. Um, and then I, I wanted to show you a little movie that this, this individual named Paul Williams and, and his co-authored um, kind of developed. You can find it on YouTube, actually, if you want. Um, but because of time, I'll probably not, discuss, not show you it. But this is a paper that just came out um, last month. And the idea was to try to explain some of the patterns that we've been observing in both the atmosphere and the, the oceans. So this is probably a numerical model of a, um, of a ACC kind of jet. So then I'll do a little plug for my work that I'm doing now, which is you know, what goes on here um, in between these regimes where we have energy cascading to upper, to larger scale, and energy cascading to smaller scale. But we actually see in, our, in my mooring observations um, definitive evidence that there's instabilities that drive um, uh, energy to smaller scale. So with that, I'd like to thank the following people, particularly Boris for um, hosting me, um, NASA for the money, and then uh, remote sensing systems and, and, and other people. So Shell Gentiman actually did a lot uh, by providing the microwave SST for us. And then Chel Dudley Chelton was nice enough to let me use his database of track studies. And that's it. <laughs>